Hello and welcome to the Mania Podcast. Today I'm doing something just a bit different. I normally have the crypt cleaning section at the end of the episode, but today the news is so substantial that I wanted to bring it to the forefront of any listener's attention. And the news is that for the last three weeks I've been working in Europe to do something a bit more grand and ambitious with this show. I wanted to bring episodes shot and recorded live in the locations of the stories themselves. So there will be two new special episodes coming out. The first one will be entitled The Stockholm Bloodbath, and the second is London, A Carnival of Gallows. Now, seeing as how these episodes contain not just audio, but videography, I cannot be certain how much time it will take to splice together the audio and the video. These, this is new terrain for us, and we're going to do our best to make it as perfect as possible. Given how much time and energy was put into it, it would be a shame to haphazardly throw things together and call it an episode. We're going to try to make it as perfect and as highly produced as possible, given the humble equipment we have to work with. But until then, uh, the show goes on as normal, and I'm bringing to you today a lovely piece, a rendition of a classic. I introduce to you the Pied Piper from Hell. Everybody is haunted by something. Whether we know it or not, we spend the majority of our lives trying to make sense of the past. Caught in the paradox of every moment becoming our future, it's easy to find ourselves stuck between worlds. And it's here, between the underworld and our own reality, that the veil between these two realms grows thin. It's here, in these moments of confusion, that ghosts linger on our shoulder. It can be a thought in an old, empty house, a whisper in the dark, a melody sung from a loft that is never inhabited, a hand in the darkness. Though these entities reach out to us beyond our own preference, it's not safe to assume that they always exist outside of ourselves. It's not obvious that we are not haunting ourselves. But sometimes, almost certainly, they are. Malicious, malevolent, and beyond our grasp of understanding, they exist to torment, to wallow, and drag us into their endlessly self-cannibalizing misery. Silver tongues and gray dresses turning corners. Hanging mouths howling silence into the hollow night. A low humming in the bowels of a basement overgrown with mold and bloodstains turned black from a murder never recovered. The fragments you stumble upon of a corpse. Ivory gears and deteriorated cogs of a ravaged machine left to rot. Though we can turn a blind eye to the machinations of our phantasmic ancestors, lingering just beyond the thin veil separating our realms, they are always there. In our blood, in our thoughts, and in our stories. My name is Harlequin Grimm. And these are the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Day, the Devil's Night, Halloween, whatever you prefer to call it, these days are fast approaching. I feel the enthusiasm for this spectral holiday coursing through the veins of artists and creators everywhere. Though the various themes of Halloween are summoned in every episode and mania, I find myself similarly inspired and excited to be creating these stories during these most special months. And now that we have just wrapped up our Demon series, I'm happy to extend my reach to stranger stories still, beyond the shaking bed frames of possessed nuns and the Latin rites of exorcists. But before I do, I would like to thank my listeners from the bottom of my haunted and callow heart for supporting this show. Since there are no sponsors or ads, audience support is critical in keeping this train running, whether it's by telling me directly, sharing it with your friends, or supporting it monetarily. All are fantastic ways to aid in the reanimation of these tales. If you would like to support the show directly, visit patreon.com forward slash harlequingrim. Once more, that's patreon.com forward slash harlequingrim. There, you'll find patron exclusives such as a passkey to lock stories on my website, as well as handwritten, personally sealed letters. All these and more for the ghouls and ghosts helping bring this theater to life. Now, 
Let us begin. Our tale takes us to Germany in 1384, to Hamlin, the principality of Kallenberg, at the confluence of the rivers Hamel and Wesser. Sound familiar? If it doesn't yet, it surely will. A farmer by the name of Callan, once more, left the granaries beside the farm with a scowl. He thrust his walking cane aside, whistled for his dog to follow him, and marched into town, shoving through any authority that tried to stop him from barging in on the mayor's office. The interaction was explosive. Callan informed the mayor that his granaries had yet again been ravaged by rats, and that the town had, by now, without a shade of doubt, an infestation on their hands. Half of their stores had been ruined, and if something were not done quickly, they would have little to show for the warmer months, and winter would be fatal. By then, the mayor had received many alarms to the rat infestation. However, Callan wasn't the first farmer unable to quell his rage. The mayor and extermination experts had already employed everything that art, invention, and experience could apply to chase the rats away. In the late afternoon of the day that Callan stormed into the mayor's office, a curious individual dressed in multicolored robes strolled into town from the road that stretched farthest into the horizon. His curiously striped robes were made of leather, dyed in rich crimson, black, violet, and pale hues. With a hood that obscured his face and captured the alarm of the town as he, too, walked unbidden into the mayor's office, the stranger explained that he had a solution to Hamlin's problem. It was around this time that those in the audience of this bizarre interaction began to notice strange details about the stranger who'd let himself into their town. Firstly, the way the hood draped his head seemed to suggest of two distended forms protruding, such as curled horns, and, secondly, the way his shoes were warped about his feet suggested some hideous deformation. Though fear was spreading rapidly throughout the town, Fear of the rat infestation and the famine that would come with it was even more rampant, so much so that, when the stranger named his prize for taking care of their problem, the mayor agreed to it, a thousand guilders. As soon as the visitor turned his back on the crowd, which had gathered to hear his proposition, whispers swam throughout the town. Stories of the disfigured stranger with a strange dialect and awkward gait spread with rampant exaggerations. As others gathered outside their home to observe the stranger, they noticed his swift movements. His clumsily stitched leather attire fluttered as he walked with great purpose to an open field beside the town. Here he withdrew from his sleeve a flute, what appeared to be made out of bone, whose holes issued a dark smoke as he evoked from it a smooth, seductive melody. It commanded the air and rose up the hair on those who watched from afar, and the wind around his flute simmered as if from a great heat. That was when they saw it. At first, they thought it was a gust of wind stirring the fields he stood upon, but soon it was made clear. It was just a handful. Then it was dozens, hundreds, small black and gray bodies arriving from their holes in swarms, rats crowding around the piper, as he blew his entrancing tune. Without interrupting his melody, he walked further from the fields. The halo of rats followed, matching every step. They did this without fidgeting, scratching, or cleaning their snouts as creatures of the earth are wont to do. They stopped and moved with a mechanical certainty, and they did this until the stranger walked them straight into the river, Wesser, beside the town. The hordes flung themselves into the waters with that same unflinching movement. They were swept away by the thousands. Even field mice and several other rodents of different species were caught in the piper's melody. Though their movements didn't stop here. Next, the rodents kicked with fury from the surface of the river, swimming with a stubbornness as if the music had infected their muscles, and even that far and away from the piper's tune, they drowned themselves. They did this until their bodies bobbed and returned to the surface of the river, gray and black, 
and only after then, when the last of this color faded from the vantage point of the town, swept off into the distance, did the piper turn back toward the village, replacing the flute into his sleeve, head bowed. By the time the mayor had been summoned and the town verified the extraordinary claim of the piper's methods, the crowds were agitated, disturbed, fidgeting. Sweat protruded on the brow of those closest to the piper who could sense the air of empowerment, arrogance, and certainty that one conjures up when telling tales of malevolent spirits come to haunt the living. When the mayor heard of the piper's flute playing, he stood up from his seat to refuse the payment that was agreed upon. The piper, scanning the crowds with both curiosity and a low impatience, turned back to his client and said, I named my price, and we agreed upon it. Would you be so bold as to break your promise? I would, the mayor replied, agitated saliva dribbling onto his beard. I would, and I would demand that anybody who stinks of witchcraft be banned from my town henceforth and you should be glad that it is not the gallows for you. For the second time in just an hour, this circumstance of the infestation pardoned the town's ill feelings of the stranger. Only this time, it was the grace of his spell having saved them from a most unendurable winter, that the foul signature of witchcraft as witnessed by hundreds was pardoned, and so the piper's life went unthreatened. Escorted by hushed curses and prayers, the piper left the town, only as he rested on a hill overlooking the very field where the deed was accomplished, the piper thought to himself that he would not be so merciful. Hamlin was not without its own agitated spirit. The memory of the piper's bizarre appearance and unsettling act haunted the town, and though they all knew themselves to be safer for having exterminated the rats which played to their stores, they wondered if the price to be paid would yet be worth it, for even the lowest of peasants and farmers knew that the mayor's arrogance was unfavorable. Residents of the town could see the piper on the days prior to his second and fateful visit. Many thought, at first glance, that a stag had wandered from the forests. Instead, much to the black sinking in their stomachs, they would realize that they were looking at the silhouette of the piper, his hood and robes cast aside, revealing his goat's legs and curled horns as he watched, utterly still, from afar. It was St. John and Paul's day that the piper descended from his hill, while the town's elders and religious figures were feasting, celebrating in the evening, he walked back into town. This time, his leathers were dyed black and his hood was drawn back. The horns which grew from his head captured an air of majesty over the grotesque portions of his face. One of his eyes contained the rectangular pupil and dirtied gold iris found in goats, while his teeth were a horrid mash of serrated incisors and regular chompers. The empty streets welcomed him. Children and young adolescents watched, crouched behind windows, peeping through the keyholes of doors. If the wind plucked up his scent, they would be accosted by the harsh rotting which wafted off of the piper's clothes. Much less leather than just simply skinned flesh, crudely fashioned into something that resembles a robe. At the center of Hamlin, the stranger once more withdrew his pipe and blew into it. This time, it was those who could see him that were led from their hiding places. The piper's clawed hands moved expertly as he blew into the piece. Children began to form around him, half-dressed, naked from bathing, stopped short from whatever activity occupied them. They came by the number of precisely 130 from their homes, crouching around the piper with that same stillness as seen in the rats. Then they followed him. The piper led them down Hamlin's winding roads, past the homes and shops and through the fields. Their eyes had turned pale in their skulls, their feet bloodied as they collected scars walking with indifference over sharp stones and boulders. They were led to a neighboring mountain, Kopfelberg, under which lay the town's sewers. It is here that criminals were commonly executed, 
and it would be here that the stranger would, at last, receive a compensation for the services provided. It was not one by one. That would be too delicate. Like the rats, the children were led into the mountain, the gaping maw of a cavern whose mouth dropped into a merciless darkness. At the edge of this abyss was where the piper led the children, and it was at the edge of this abyss that he thrust them off to the tune of a smooth, seductive melody. A young, deaf girl, immune to the entrancing tune of the piper, had followed him all the while. She had watched as the children were swallowed by that pitch blackness, with tears streaming down her cheeks. The piper had brushed past her, knowing full well that she was left to witness, and thusly returned to the town so that folks like you and I might have this tale to tell. The event was so horrific for Hamlin that, at the corner of the mountain's opening, is left an inscription, which was also copied into the deed of the town. Any event is marked with, quote, done in the year, comma, after the disappearance of our children. It was my full intention to bring to you a collection of at least three ghostly tales which contained either malevolent spirits, demons, or familiars. But after I finished bringing the first piece to life, I was left with the harrowing realization that the piper demanded too much time to be told with another story, let alone two more. So I'll be saving the next execution for another episode, what will be entitled, quote, A Curious Collection of Ghostly Tales. Doubtless, something worthwhile to have on in the background of gritty industrial music during a Halloween party, or perhaps even to whet the appetite of anybody participating in a seance. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed Mania's rendition of The Pied Piper. This is a classic German folktale, and as I am learning, like all German folktales, they are ruthlessly packed with horrid imagery. There were several things I did to bring the story to lie. First of all, were the specific scenes illustrating the piper's entrance and introduction into the town. There are no recounts where the piper demonstrates having the bodily traits of a satyr, demon, or forest spirit, as I alluded to. Oftentimes the piper is described as being merely human, which I felt was unfitting, even bizarre, considering the gravity of his magical abilities. That was also why I made some subtle descriptions suggesting that the piper collected human skins with which to adorn himself, no doubt these situations happened quite frequently to him. There was also no farmer named Callan, mentioned in any specific records, and nothing besmirching the town's mayor as a belligerent drunk who spittles over himself. I took that liberty because anybody who denies the payment of a spirit which single-handedly executes a rat infestation with a flute probably shouldn't be thought of as a highly intelligent. Otherwise, the majority of this folktale was presented as it is commonly told. The details of the inscription left on the mountain and the deeds of the town appear to be, according to what I've read, true remnants of a bewildering story. There's evidence to suggest that the nearly 130 boys that went missing was an event known as the Children's Exodus, since this did, in fact, take place during a time of famine, poverty, and plague as symbolized by the rats. There was a calling for boys above the age of 14, to colonize new settlements in Eastern Europe. There's even some evidence to suggest in Polish ledgers of a sudden immigration from Hamlin, as the individuals in these ledgers have names that could only originate from that town's heritage. Other interpretations of the story suggest that psychogenic illness such as dancing mania, which had outbreaks in the late 13th century. People, and in this case children, would often dance for miles until reaching other towns. Even less likely, some suspect that a psychopathic pedophile somehow convinced 130 of the town's children to follow him to an undisclosed location, never to be seen again. Though, to do this undetected seems even less likely than a cloven-footed and horned piper slaughtering them with a flute's tune. Which, of course, is my preferred version. Thank you, from the bottom of my haunted heart, for listening to Mania. Once more, if you would like to support the show, I must direct you to patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm. One-time declarations of love can also be made via the support page on my website, 
harlequingrim.com. I do sincerely hope you will join the ranks of wonderful individuals bringing this nightmarish theater to life. They are the lifeblood of this show, and I owe them my deepest thanks, which, with a bowed head and a sacrificial offering, I am giving them now. Thank you for listening. I do very much hope you will join me next time.